welcome uh, to Foresight's Health Extension Group. Um, it's uh, part of, um, like Health Extension really has been like part of the Foresight's core uh, for really since, since its inception. So much long before I came, uh, I came around, but Christine is here on the call as well, so she could, she could tell you all about it. Um, but we used to do technical competitions, especially on using atomic precision for health extension. And then we used to do public educational salons. And then maybe like two, two or three years ago, suddenly those salons, especially on uh, health extension, really totally kicked off. And it wasn't only the public that joined, but a lot of investors too. And there was just this really, I think, kind of like very rich um, growth in the community around that. And so we decided to focus much more effort on specific uh, on specific aspects of investment, especially on health extension investment. And um, then we we got funding from Sonia, uh, who sponsored um, much more focused health extension investment salons. And we were about to do um, four of those this year uh, in person, of which we did one um, that was focused on um, onboarding new investors uh, into the space. Um, and then COVID hit. And then uh, when COVID hit, we pivoted to uh, online uh, salons. I'm still admitting folks from the waiting list here. But once COVID hit, we pivoted to daily on online salons. And they were not only focused on health extension, but they were focused on trying to find ways in which COVID-19 could help a variety of different technologies um, that are important for the long-term future, kind of like how to accelerate those. Um, and aging, you know, not, not, not surprisingly, popped up over and over again in those, uh, in those salons. Um, and so uh, we decided that, you know, it really was some, some kind of like a more long term and, and perhaps like a little bit more private container to actually um, uh, get some discussion going. Um, I think it's not surprising that, you know, I think even many people here that are on the call have kind of like pivoted or at least adapted their ongoing research uh, on, on, on anti-aging strategies to at least accommodate uh, COVID-19. Um, because I think really if there's any one field that should come out stronger after this crisis, then it really is uh, the work on, uh, on aging and rejuvenation. So uh, I think uh, this is kind of like an attempt to create an ongoing container so that given this pace at which many things are currently changing, we can get something like continuous coordination around all, from all of you going and we can get something kind of like a idea flow or a flow of questions, a flow of ideas going so that we can all coordinate uh, kind of like moving forwards our efforts a little better in how we can make the most of the opportunity that COVID-19 presents and then, uh, you know, much more collaboration uh, beyond that. So I'm really welcoming you to make that mailing list and the weekly meetings as kind of interactive and as useful as you can for you, right? Like this, basically what I want to get out of this for Foresight is how can we as an organization help you best accelerate your in health extension. So I really welcome all of you. I will tell you when someone's spamming, but for now I want to encourage people to be really proactive, right? And actually use this mailing list um, and, and, and really take some ownership of that. So whenever you have a question and opportunity you'd like to discuss that is directly um, trying to advance health extensions in the, in, in the context of COVID-19, just make it a title, send it to the mailing list, and we'll see whether we can get some discussion going on that. Um, and we're going to have weekly meetings. This is the first one, so welcome all of you. Um, and uh, today we are going to uh, discuss reverse engineering the genomic cause of disease. And then next week, um, and I will send a Google Calendar invite out right after this meeting is over, we're going to have Gordon Locke and uh, a Foresight Fellow, Daniel Borja, who's going to present on glycans, aging, and COVID-19. He has presented on this uh, before at a salon, um, uh, Dania has, and so now we're trying to draw the connection a little stronger. Uh, so if you want to um, suggest a topic that we should tackle afterwards, just email me. I think Carl already pointed out that Aubrey made a good point, you know, that actually uh, in, the, in the welcome email um, that actually, uh, you know, there are tax dollars now that we can really uh, be spending on aging, given the current response to the lockdowns, you know, it's, uh, we can make a good case that actually uh, uh, taxpayers are willingly spending uh, kind of um, um, are really spending tax dollars on helping the elderly. So I think, uh, you know, tackling that change of future salon and how to make the most of that opportunity, that, that's one option, but just please be as forthcoming as you want. Um, you know, we can discuss uh, a variety of different topics in those meetings. So again, just an invitation to all of you to make it as useful as possible by using the mailing list, introducing yourself, uh, the collaboration doc, and I'm going to share all the links in the chat. But for now, I want to come Sonia, um, and I think everyone here is 
unmute themselves. So Sonia, thank you so much for joining. First of all, thank you so much for enabling this container. I think it's been something that I wanted to do for a really long time, rather than the more public facing salons, actually try to get a discussion going uh, amongst the people that are working on this topic on a daily basis. And, um, you know, I'm really hoping that uh, this initial, uh, initial series of which you really suggested uh, the topic of today uh, can be like kind of like a model, an example of what we can discuss uh, throughout the, the next few meetings. All right, so Sonia, uh, you uh, enabled the Salon via 100 Plus Capital, which uh, is a VC that uh, you started to really um, kind of like help, um, uh, help the uh, anti-aging space mature. And uh, you also wrote a best-selling book on the topic of longevity, which is called 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything. Um, and you sold a media company to Medium and then helped start uh, Singularity University quite a while back. And now we are really happy to, uh, to count you amongst uh, our board members and you're also on the board of Tier Foundation. So thank you so much for joining today. You gave the impetus uh, for the topic of today. And I think before Cosmo launches in the, uh, into the initial presentation, I would love for you maybe to uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, why you were interested in discussing the relationship between viruses and, uh, and aging. So right. I think you can unmute, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, no, I'm really happy that we, uh, that we can do it this way. I mean, these salons were supposed to be in person, but they're, they're not. <laughs> uh, and, um, but this, you know what, this might actually uh, turn out to be a blessing in disguise because um, if we do meet on a regular basis and we can, we can share, it's a lot easier to meet on a regular basis when we're just doing it uh, online and uh, it doesn't matter where we are. So, um, so that's great. We can bring our brains together. So thank you, Allison, for organizing all of this. You've been incredible during this entire time. Uh, and I'm, I'm really honored to be on the board of the Foresight Institute. Um, and so, uh, and really happy to be supporting the longevity series. Um, I suggested this topic today at, because I had read, uh, Cosmo had posted an article uh, or blog post that he had written on the relationship between uh, viruses and the diseases of aging. And it, it occurred to me that in, at least in my mind for a very long time, I sort of separated the diseases of aging from infectious diseases. In my mind, there was like the diseases of aging over here and infectious diseases over here and a big wall between them and no relationship between the two other than like maybe the infectious diseases wear you down and like puts load on your immune system and all of that, but not, it's not really a cause. Um, and then after I read Cosmo's paper, I got thinking about one of the uh, companies we funded as part of the uh, Teal Foundation um, breakout labs, uh, Cortexime, uh, that uh, it has the theory of sort of this uh, bacterial reason for uh, Alzheimer's bacteria going into the brain and creating um, an immune response that causes all the tangles and things um, uh, that eventually kill you with Alzheimer's disease. And you know they've IPO'd, they're doing very well. And, and I think their thesis is solid. And it got me thinking, wow, maybe we've had this huge blind spot for a long time and we should not have this wall in between the two different areas. And maybe they go hand in hand and maybe we'd make a lot more progress if we started seeing things that way. And so I'm very excited to discuss this and to learn more um, from anybody who's actually working on these types of things. So I'll just leave it at that and let's, uh, let's jump into things. Well, Cosmo, thank you so, so much for joining. Um, I posted uh, one of the blog posts already here. Uh, I'm really, really happy that you made uh, time to come on so quickly. Um, I, I'm going to post your LinkedIn as well. So if people want to follow up uh, on, your, on your background, you've been a Fawcett Longevity Fellow, I think, two years ago, if I'm correct. And uh, I've just been really admiring the work that you've been putting out and really just open sourcing a lot of your efforts. I'm super excited that you're going to discuss this topic today especially that you'll be sharing not only, uh, I think, material that has already been seen by many, but also a little bit of new material. And thank you so much for uh, trying to get everything together in such a short period, period of time. The stage is yours. I'm going to post more info about you in the chat. Great. Uh, so can everybody hear me okay? Is the audio working? It's working great. And uh, can everybody see my shared window? Can see it. Perfect. All right. So this is who I am. I'm a trained astrophysics physicist. I used to look for aliens. That's a long time ago. Uh, more recently, since the COVID pandemic started, I've been working on this open source project called Quarantine at Home that does uh, very large scale drug screening. Uh, currently looking for people who want to volunteer their computer power to finding COVID drugs. So talk to me later about that. It's all open source. 
Uh, I'm going to give you the full warning ahead of time that a lot of this stuff is complete crazy, quack pottery, speculative bullshit, okay? Now, that, that blog post I wrote that Sonia found so interesting, I wrote about two years ago. It was as soon as I started antidepressants for the first time in my life, and it led to, shall we say, unchecked creativity. So I give you all a full warning ahead of time that this all might be completely crazy, but I think I'm onto something here. And we're off. So... We don't really know what aging is. We like to theorize about what aging is. We can see aging from the outside. We can tell when people are getting older. And beyond that, that outer appearance of what aging might be, we also know that there's a bunch of diseases that kill us, and those diseases seem to go up with age, interestingly enough. So I like to think of this as a really complicated uh, system interacting. You, you start in time with your genetic code and your mother's health while she, while she incubates you. And then you go into like the early stage of your life, which is development. And then after that, things get really complicated. We've got a bunch of biomarkers, hormones, gene expression patterns, metabolites, everything that you could possibly measure about the human body under the sun. You've got a couple of kind of early stage signs of aging, like body weight and diabetes and, and how old you look in general. And then you've got these endpoints that we call death. And ultimately, we, what we want to do is prevent all of this stuff. But in terms of this complexity of what causes what, there's really no sign of telling which way the arrow flows. The only thing we know is that time, the best we can tell, only flows in a single direction. And the, gen the genome that you start with is pretty much the only thing that we can provably say causes all of it, right? So I tend to focus on genetics for that reason. So a brief overview of some of these genetic studies. We, we have now done for a large number of diseases of aging, genomic samples on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, okay? And these genetic studies tend to give us indications of what genes are most important for every single disease. And effectively what we do is if we stretch across the entire human genome, we can find individual mutations in that genome that tend to occur around very specific genes, okay? And these are called Manhattan plots. This is the result. And you can basically see that the genes that cause a specific disease rise out of the noise. And you get a different Manhattan plot for every single disease of interest. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of these. Another thing I want to point out is that somewhat of an intermediary um, uh, uh, observation about the human body as you get older is that cells that are senescent seem to increase. And we don't really know what cell senescence is. We just know that there's cells that behave a certain kind of broken way, and those cells seem to accumulate over time. And ce cellular senescence is often debated what the precise definition of it is, but there's kind of two major biomarkers that have arisen in cellular senescence. Overall, the pattern of a senescent cell is that it no longer divides. It gets stuck in a specific location in the cell cycle, and that particular phenotype is being driven by a very specific gene called P16, okay? So that's the canonical definition of a senescent cell, although some people will argue otherwise. Another uh, uh, biomarker that has arisen in recent years is this enzyme called the senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. Somebody at one point recognized that there's an enzyme in there doing something. It makes cells really easy to stain, so experimentally, it's really great for viewing where the senescent cells in the tissue are located. And it seems to correlate pretty strongly with this first P16 marker. So I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's first because it is, it is the obvious definition of an aging-related disease. I spent about three years at the UCSF Alzheimer's department, and I can tell you about many stories there. But there's a new hypothesis arising in Alzheimer's right now. It, the disease was originally characterized by Dr. Alwa Alzheimer's way back in 19 whatever. And he found these beta amyloid plaques forming in the brain, but he didn't really know why they were there. And, and for the last century, we've been focusing on this beta amyloid deposits. But in recent years, it's been increasingly evident that these amyloid fibers might actually be a good thing. They might actually be part of the immune system because we're now finding that herpes DNA and certain bacteria and fungi are located inside these beta amyloid clumps. Now about that amyloid beta, 
it, it, it is first attached to the outside of a neuron cell membrane and then cleaved and then it crystallizes and forms these large clumps on top of the cell membrane. A lot of people don't realize this, but the earliest beta amyloid formations in the brain actually form on top of these very special lipids in the cell membrane. And these are called gangliosides, so named because they were first discovered in the brain. Now these gangliosides are a special type of lipid that are, are the defining characteristic of what's called a cholesterol-rich microdomain, which is also known as a lipid raft. And these are parts of the cell membrane where a lot of interesting things happen, including the import and export of cargo from the cell. Now that senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, that second marker of, of senescent cells, turns out they eventually figured out what that damn enzyme is. It's a gene called GLB1, and the job of that gene is to specifically process those GM1 gangliocide lipids that form lipid domains. And what this enzyme does is it chops off that galactose at the very end of the lipid. So that's a really interesting connection between cellular aging, which is what we call senescence, and Alzheimer's disease and amyloid formation. Now moving on, this is speculation time. Another defining characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of of a different protein called tau. And instead of accumulating outside the neuron, it accumulates inside the neuron. What we know that tau is, is it's a, it's a protein that regulates the formation of microtubules in the neurons. And what a lot of people don't realize, unless they study herpes virus biology, herpes literally transports through neurons by hitching a ride on these motor proteins that climb across microtubules. And the way that herpes virus gets into the brain is it infects some peripheral part of your body, like in a limb, and then it slowly climbs up your spinal cord into your brain. It doesn't need to get through the blood-brain barrier because it's literally crawling through the neurons. And it's highly possible that that tau protein is part of either an antiviral defense to prevent these microtubules from transporting the virus, or it could be a, a way that the virus has hijacked our own physiology to get through the, the neural network. <clears throat> Now let's talk about genetics. This is the Manhattan plot for Alzheimer's disease. And the primary gene that sets Alzheimer's risk is, as you all know, ApoE. Turns out ApoE is a protein in the LDL particle. This is the bad cholesterol that's associated with heart disease. Cholesterol is transported through the blood in these cholesterol particles, and different proteins wrap around these cholesterol particles to allow them to be trafficked through the body. And ApoE is one of those proteins that allows cholesterol particles to be targeted to certain cells in the body. So it's the top marker for Alzheimer's. But ApoE has another secret. Not only does it predict Alzheimer's disease, it also predicts hepatitis C-induced liver cancer. So if you have hepatitis, you have a risk of developing liver cancer as a consequence of that. And the ApoE version that you have predicts your likelihood of developing liver cancer. And the reason is quite simple. The hepatitis C virus, as it's forming inside the liver cell, literally binds to the ApoE protein as a lipid particle is being produced by the liver cell. And in doing so, the virus literally hides inside the bad cholesterol LDL particle. And when it does this, it can hide from the immune system, all mediated via ApoE. Now, this is the only virus proven to do this, but I have a funny feeling that in the next 10 years, we will find and prove that other viruses do the exact same thing. They specifically traffic in LDL particles in order to avoid immune detection. So cholesterol particles are formed, released, and when it comes to their destination cells, actually taken into new cells through those cholesterol-rich microdomains, which as you recall, these are the domains targeted by the senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, which is the second marker of cellular aging. Now, whether or not the herpes virus gets into the brain via this ApoE mechanism, not really proven yet, but there is one lab run by this guy, Fernando Valvedevezo, he has shown in two different studies that the ApoE version that you have predicts how much herpes virus can get into your brain at time of death. Now, these are all mice studies, but still important. In fact, one of the recent studies that he's done has shown that every bad version of the ApoE gene you have increases the amount of herpes virus DNA that gets transported into the brain. And these are all in mice, but notice that the scale on this axis is logarithmic. Every one of these tick marks is a tenfold increase 
in the amount of herpes DNA that is found in the brain at time of death. So my consensus for Alzheimer's, I really think that because the APOE gene is, is the top marker and because, because cholesterol particles are somehow relevant, this is the mechanism by which certain viruses are getting into the brain, possibly herpes, right? Now let's go on to metabolic sy syndrome. These are some of the earlier diseases of aging. It's not really an endpoint disease. It's more of a midlife point of disease or, or point of aging that's, that's correlated with other diseases of aging. So we're talking obesity and diabetes. The, the genetic architectures of diabetes, which is excessive blood sugar and obesity, which is excessive body fat, they are different genetic architectures because diabetes and obesity are completely different diseases. We like to think of them as the same, and indeed there is one gene that seems to be shared between them. The, the dominant obesity gene, FTO, which we'll talk about later, is also a, a genetic predictor of diabetes. But fundamentally, the rest of the genetic architecture is very different. Now, when it comes to diabetes, You'll have to read my blog. I'm not going to go too much in detail on this, but I have pretty conclusive evidence at this point, and other labs have found this as well, that the top marker for diabetes is actually a gene that is disrupted by man-made chemicals, the most famous of which is BPA. That's the chemical that's used in water bottles, and to this day is the, is the plastic film that still lines the inside of every single Coke can sold in America. BPA has got the exact same chemical structure as DDT, except for these chlorine atoms. And DDT is that fertilizer that caused a lot of environmental damage. A lot of agricultural runoff of DDT tends to occur in the Mississippi River Valley. And fundamentally, this is where you find most of your diabetes cases in America. So that's a whole other story. We can go, about, we can go into that in a different talk if you'd like. So let's focus on obesity. Obesity is my, is my passion project. Everyone in my family is super fat. I run a nonprofit that studies obesity. And here are my thoughts on what drives this disease. This is the genetic architecture of obesity. We know what some of these genes do. We have not found what most of these genes do. Most people who study obesity tend to focus on the interactions between the hypothalamus and the brain and the peripheral, peripheral nervous system, specifically the, the vagus nerve, which underlines the core of the parasympathetic nervous system, and the sympathetic nervous system, which is basically the fight or flight nervous system. A bunch of hormones in your body are made, like insulin and leptin. Those hormones go to the hypothalamus in the brain. A bunch of neurons up here do a whole bunch of math to figure out, am I eating now or am I burning energy right now? And when those neurons make a decision on whether or not you should store calories or burn calories, that signal is conveyed to the rest of the body through these parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve pathways. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the fat cells are literally wired by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems. There's literally electrical signals being given to the fat cells to tell them whether or not to store energy or release energy. Now, if you zoom into the hypothalamus, Right up here in the base of the brain, there is a set of neurons that decide whether or not you should burn energy or you should consume more energy. And those neurons that cause you to burn energy are the proopio-melanocortin neurons, and they signal through what's known as the alpha-MSH proopio-melanocortin system. That's a lot of big words, but suffice it to say, there are three major loci within the huge genetic studies of hundreds of thousands of people that that specifically our, our genes found in this location of the brain. So the melanocortin-4 receptor is right there. Proopio melanocortin is the neurotransmitter that activates it. It's made by those neurons that, that stimulate energy burn and inhibit hunger. And the brain-derived neurotrophic factor is the, is the uh, programmatic uh, gene that regulates the development of this entire neural network as you're developing as a, as a baby, right? But what about this guy? This FTO gene is known as the FATSO gene, literally. No one knows what this gene does. And if you have certain versions of this gene, you're basically threefold, fourfold more likely to develop obesity. And pretty much half of all Americans are obese right now. So we need to figure out what the hell this damn gene does. And, and, and if you read the literature, no one knows what this gene does. So there is an obscure lab in Texas run by a guy named Nikhil Durander. He's, a, he's an Indian professor. He was a medical doctor in India, and he discovered viruses in India that caused obesity in farm animals. And then he came to America, and he was looking for viruses that caused the same uh, syndrome, obesity, in humans. And he found 
this common cold virus called adenovirus 36. And here's what we know about adenovirus 36. It's found more often in obese humans. If you give this virus to mice or chickens, they get morbidly obese. Now you can't do that experiment on humans for obvious reasons. But what you can do is you can take fat cells out of humans, infect it with adenovirus 36, and prove that this virus reprograms them. And here's what he found. He took, he took fat cells out of humans from both insulin-sensitive humans and insulin-resistant humans, he gave them this virus, and look at the glucose uptake go up. What this virus does is it gets inside the cell, it hijacks the insulin receptor pathway, so even if you don't have high insulin, the fat cell gets confused, and it just takes in glucose uncontrollably. And what does it do with that glucose? It uncontrollably stores fat. And this is done by the virus. It's done by the virus because if the virus stores lots of fat inside the cell that's now a virus factory, it can better proliferate, right? And I think this evidence is really strong. It's also a, a wonderful explanation of why low carb diets lead to weight loss because you're effectively cutting off the glucose supply that this virus has learned to hijack. Now, don't read this entire table, but this is a set of studies that have been done by different labs showing the prevalence of this virus in humans. And some studies show that 30% of obese humans have this virus versus 11%. This study showed that 65% of obese humans have this virus compared to 33% of non-obese humans. The point here is that this virus is ridiculously prevalent. It's a common cold virus. Most humans get exposed to it in the course of their lifetime. But some humans go on to develop obesity and other humans develop an immune response but never become obese. And these numbers are very fuzzy between the different studies because as the COVID epidemic has taught us all, finding antibodies in, in virus infected patients is really a complicated affair. So this is really an unfinished story at this point. But what about genetics? I mentioned before that this FTO gene hasn't been, no one's figured out exactly how this causes obesity. What they have done is figured out biochemically and bio, or biochemically what this, what this gene actually does in the cell. And what it does is a, is a very complicated and very fascinating story. By now, you've all probably heard of epigenetics. And epigenetics is this new field of study where scientists have found out that the human genome can be, can be methylated. It can be, it can be chemically modified in a way that regulates the expression of certain genes. But there's a new exciting field of study that most people haven't heard of, and that's called epitranscriptomics. And now they're finding that the RNA messengers that are copied from the human genome, those two are methylated. Methyl groups get attached to messenger RNA, and those methyl groups regulate the copying or the translation of proteins from that mRNA and the disposal of that mRNA. And what's, what's additionally been shown in this new epitranscriptomics field is that many of these methylation modifications affect viruses. And, and there's, there's entire review articles on this new field called viral epitranscriptomics. Now the pathway is really complicated, but suffice it to say, once these methyl groups are added to mRNA, that has a whole lot of downstream effects. And what FTO is, that top obesity gene fatso, that turns out to be an eraser of those methylation groups. So regulating the activity of that FTO gene is super important for regulating protein translation, and it's also important for viruses. In fact, if you read some of these review articles, you see that HIV, hepatitis C, Zika virus, influenza A virus, and a whole bunch of other viruses are all regulated via this methylation group that occurs on mRNA called the M6A methylation group. And the FTO gene, well, that's the eraser of that M6A modification. Now, this is the really exciting stuff. This is not a paper. This is a grant application out of the United Kingdom. There's a, there's a lab at the University of Leeds. They haven't published yet, but they wrote this grant application and they wrote, they found out that the FTO gene, this obesity gene, turns out what it does is it interacts with the Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. It's part of the herpes virus family. It's actually a virus that's very similar to the Epstein-Barr virus that causes mononucleosis. And practically every single one of us has been exposed to that virus. What this FTO gene does is it binds to a certain portion of that of that herpes virus. And then the FTO gene gets pulled inside the nucleolus of the cell, right? 
Now, what's the nucleolus? So we all know that the nucleus is where the human genome is located and kept safe. But inside the nucleus of the cell, there's another little small core called the nucleolus. And the nucleolus is where ribosomes are made. And what this guy figured out is that the FTO gene, this top obesity gene, gets sequestered inside the nucleolus when the cell gets infected by this gamma herpes virus, right? The nucleolus in recent years has been shown to be a marker for aging. In fact, as you get older and older and older, the nucleolus grows in size. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, what hasn't been shown yet is that this mechanism is the reason, but I suspect it might be. Effectively, what's happening is the FTO gene gets pulled in the nucleolus. That's where the virus lives, the herpes virus. All of its genes are made inside the nucleolus and then protected from the rest of the, of the regulatory machinery of the nucleus. And by doing that, the virus can preferentially copy its own genes and stop the copying of, of host genes. So my consensus of obesity is that it's probably a viral infection. Now let's talk about heart disease. And this is the, the third and final disease I'm gonna talk about. It's probably the most important as well because it's the leading cause of death. 25% uh, of us will die of heart disease and it's also a disease of aging because we all know it goes up with age. Could cardiovascular disease, heart disease, be caused by viruses? Well, the evidence is actually quite profound at this point. We know that influenza infections, the common flu, when you catch it, your risk of heart disease goes up by a factor of six. And that lasts for about two weeks. You catch the flu in the winter, your likelihood of having a heart attack because of that influenza infection goes up six to seven fold, depending on which study you read. And, and this isn't... This isn't a crazy idea. This is common knowledge. I've spoken to cardiologists at UCSF. They all confirm this. It's a pattern. Goes up that just for two weeks. About. Does it go up just for two weeks, or does it stay up? Approximately two weeks. It depends on it depends on the paper you read, because most of those discoveries are predicated on large scale epidemiological data, mining of hospital records, that kind of thing. So influenza. I, I forgot to put a slide in the presentation. Influenza. One of the genes of, of influenza that we name it by, like, you know, H1N1, right? That, that N number that, that, that defines which version of the flu virus you have is the neuraminidase enzyme. That enzyme binds to those GM1 gangliosides I told you about before, the same lipid membrane components that are targeted by the senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. So what does cause heart disease? And you all know the answer. You've all heard the answer. It's, it's something to do with cholesterol, and it's something to do with macrophages that eat that cholesterol. And when macrophages eat that cholesterol, they turn into these, into these stuffed things called foam cells. They fill up with cholesterol. They can't really get rid of the cholesterol. And then the, the downstream effect is you get a plaque that slowly develops over time. And then that plaque causes a blockage of the coronary artery. And then you get a heart attack because the heart no longer gets the blood it needs. So here's another picture of that. You get, you get these preliminary precursor cells called monocytes floating all around your blood. They get into a tissue. They turn into macrophages. Those macrophages eat cholesterol particles, these low-density lipoprotein particles. This is the bad cholesterol that causes heart disease. This is also the cholesterol that, uh, that, that hepatitis C virus traffics inside. If a foam cell is produced, you eventually get this bad plaque that develops. So let's talk about these foam cells. Now, a lot of people talk about foam cells and cardiovascular disease, but they never really ask the question. I, I, I have seen very few scientists ask the question, why do macrophages eat cholesterol particles? Well, maybe it's because viruses traffic inside cholesterol particles. Just, just a thought. Maybe that's why it evolved to do that, right? The other thing I'll tell you about macrophages is that macrophages come in two varieties. Well, there's really more varieties, but there's two main varieties that people talk about. This is called the polarization state. Macrophages can exist in this M1 inflammatory polarization state, and this is where they're killing pathogens, right? They could also exist in this M2 sort of inflammatory, but mostly inflammatory, anti-inflammatory state. And this M2 polarization is the state that macrophages go in after they've killed a bunch of pathogens, and they're in cleanup mode. So basically, M1 macrophages are like cops. 
M2 macrophages are kind of like the coroners and the investigators and the, the ambulances that come after a war has occurred on your streets. This is the cleanup crew, right? Foam cells are by and large M2 macrophages. They're, they're actually in this anti-inflammatory state and they're in this cleanup mode and part of that cleanup mode is eating cholesterol particles, right? But they're not in a, in a pro-inflammatory state that's suited for fighting pathogens. Now this should make you think of something, right? This sort of suggests that maybe they're being forced into the state by some evil external factor, right? Because they're effectively having all their guns taken away. Well, let's go into that. What is the underlying genomic markers of heart disease? This is what the genetic architecture looks like. There is one prominent gene right in the center of this Manhattan plot. This is the CDKN2A2B locus. This is another name for the P16 gene. And I mentioned before that if you think about cellular senescence, there's kind of two genes that mark cellular senescence for the people that study cellular aging biology. There's that senescence associated beta galactosidase and there's P16. This is the putative senescence marker. Just so happens to be the top genetic predictor of heart disease. Now that is a really important observation. So zooming in on what senescence is again, recall that this P16 gene, its primary function it, it is to lock the cell cycle. In fact, these, these, these gene symbols, CDKN, they're so named because they are part of the cyclin pathway. And what the cyclin pathway does is it regulates the cell cycle, hence the name, psych, right? The cell cycle has these numerous states where it, it decides that it's gonna copy its genome. So you get your, your genome copied into two parts. The cell eventually double checks the genome to make sure it's not gonna create errors. Then it divides into a second cell that's called mitosis right? But senescence is when the cell cycle gets locked into a certain state. It's this G0 to G1 transition that's frozen. There's, there's a break that's inserted right here, preventing the cell from moving on to copy its genome and eventually divide. Now that break, this, this block between the G0 to G1 transition is caused by the P16 gene becoming active. It inhibits the transition between G0 and G1. Well, guess what also inhibits cell cycles from moving from G0 to G1 phase? Viruses do. The herpes simplex 1 virus of Alzheimer's fame and also cold sore fame, this is the virus that causes cold sores, it blocks the G1 to S transition. Um, cytomegalovirus, which is another virus that practically all of us have lurking inside of us right now. Very common herpes virus specifically blocks via P16 the, the transition of the cell cycle. Uh, human papillomavirus of cervical cancer fame, also now shown to cause lung cancer. Human papillomavirus also uses this exact same mechanism to block the G1 to S transition. And most importantly of all, influenza A induces cell cycle arrest in the G0 to G1 phase quite possibly via the exact same gene, P16. And as I mentioned before, influenza virus causes heart attacks. We know this from the epidemiological data. So how is it that the cell cycle arrest from G0 to G1, possibly mediated via the P16 senescence marker, how is it that this leads to heart disease, which has something to do with foam cells and macrophages? Well, if you dig into the literature, there's a direct connection. A number of papers have shown that when the P16 gene becomes active and macrophages enter a senescent state, they by and large switch over to the M2 anti-inflammatory polarization state and the proliferation of the pro-inflammatory M1 macrophages that are actually capable of killing pathogens, those go down. So here's one paper that showed that. Here's a much more recent paper from just last year they showed two different things that, that in, in advanced age, there is an increase in the frequency of the P16 activated cells in the body. And specifically with respect to macrophages, there's P16 activation and also high activity of that senescence associated beta galactosidase activity. So what's the ultimate conclusion is that, that this senescence mechanism fundamentally underlies the behavior of macrophages and sticks them into a state where they're more likely to become uh, atherogenic foam cells that cause heart disease. And this, is, this, this, this uh, is intimately tied in with viral pathology as well. Here's another paper showing that, that uh, viruses, including members of the herpes virus family, pox viruses, 
they all encode certain genes, either either activating via side uh, pathways or via the p16 pathway, turn on a mechanism that pushes the macrophage into the M2 anti-inflammatory state, just so that the virus can survive without being fought off by, by what's needed, which is the M1 inflammatory macrophages. So my consensus on cardiovascular disease, well, viruses probably cause that too. We have epidemiological evidence that influenza causes heart attacks. We know what heart disease is at the, at the pathology level. It's macrophages eating cholesterol particles. We, we know that cholesterol particles provably traffic other viruses. And what remains to be shown is whether or not those, those LDL cholesterol particles also traffic the viruses that we think actually cause this, like influenza or herpes. Now, the last portion of this, of this presentation, probably the most relevant. You have to speed our... up, dear Cosmo. You're two minutes over time. All right. I, I've only got a few slides left. So COVID-19. This is the this is disease we all care about right now because if we don't get it taken care of, it's the disease that's going to kill us all. There have been two genetic markers that have recently been shown to be related to COVID-19 severity. The APOE gene of Alzheimer's fame, which again traffics lipid particle or traffics uh, of viruses, possibly traffics COVID. And guess what? Just last week, a lab at Scripps Research Institute has demonstrated this. They have demonstrated that the more cholesterol you have floating around in your blood, facilitated via the APOE gene, the more of your cells become infected with COVID-19. Like they have now shown this, that, that cholesterol transport via APOE traffics COVID-19 into peripheral cells and leads to the increased genome count inside the cell. And lastly, this paper is really fascinating because it practically recapitulates everything that I wrote about two years ago regarding lipid drafts. Final marker, final two slides, blood groups. Uh, your, your blood type is, is determined by a set of glycans that are attached to your blood cells. You can either have type O blood, or if you have this group added, you have type A. If you have a galactose added, you have type B. This ABO gene is the gene that determines your blood type. It's the fifth most important heart disease marker, and it's now currently the second most important COVID-19 marker. And guess what? The blood type antigens, type O, type A, and type B blood types, they have the same glycobiology backbone, glucose, galactose, glycnac, and galactose, as the GM1 lipids of lipid rafts that are processed by the senescence associated beta galactosidase. And if any of you can figure out why this alignment happens, you're going to make a big splash in the anti-aging field. Sorry, I'm over time. Um, what questions do people have? Thank you so, so much. I'm really happy that you're finishing off on this because we're gonna continue with glycans at next week's meeting on Friday at uh, 1 p. At 11, 11 a.m. Uh, but for now, uh, before we're going to launch into questions, and I'm encouraging people to collect more of them uh, in the in the chat, so I can just unmute you one by one. Uh, Amy, I think, is also on this call, and I think Amy may have uh, a few other additional comments uh, to kind of kickstart the discussion. Amy, is it okay if I unmute you? Uh, welcome. It's really, really nice to see you. Unmute. Hi. Um, I'm Amy. It's great to meet all of you. Um, let me quickly share my screen. I have a couple of slides. Or is that okay? Yes. Um, I think it says it's disabled. It says host disabled you screen can, share. You can now share your screen. Perfect. All right. Let me do you know quickly. You know. Okay. Hold on. Coming up here. And ah. And where's my play? Okay. Um, so can you see this? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So I love molecular biology, but went big picture with my five minutes. So this is me with Rudy Tanzi, Robert Moyer on the other side. Um, I work with them at Harvard. Um, they're doing what's called the brain microbiome project it was thought crazy about five years ago, but doesn't seem as crazy now. Um, they are looking at Alzheimer's brains, but also healthy brains, um, autopsy brains, and they found um, organisms in all brains um, with some changes. So we're looking at a potential brain microbiome, um, which may be, you know, not that different from the gut microbiome. 
Um, and one thing, Cosmo, quickly, is that Rob, um, it's terrible. He uh, passed away a couple months ago from glioblastoma. He was the person who created the amyloid hypothesis for Alzheimer's um, and did most of the work. Um, we were good friends. And one of the things that he thought um, that he was studying before he died was amylin in the pancreas with diabetes. That he was also studying as an antimicrobial peptide, similar to what you were talking about with amyloid in the brain. Um, and he actually thought that amylin was possibly even more potent as an antimicrobial peptide than amyloin beta. Um, so next slide quickly. Um, I just want to say here's another uh, study that I think just sits there. This is Stephen Quake at Stanford. Um, this was a couple years ago. He looked in the blood of immunocompromised patients, used a new technique, self uh, circulating self-free DNA sequencing. Um, he found so many organisms, it, bacterial, viral, fungal, in the blood of these patients, 99% of them were unknown to science. I mean, they just don't map to, to organisms that, first of all, they weren't thought to be able to persist in the body, let alone the blood. So take away quickly is the body's not sterile. We don't even know what's there half the time. So there's so many organisms that may contribute to disease and also aging processes. So next quickly. So this is, uh, by the way, his conclusion. These novel microbes have potential consequences for human health. They may prove to be the cause of acute or chronic diseases that to date have unknown etiology. I agree. Okay. So moving quickly, my slides will move. Um, oh. hmm. <laughs> Hold on. Stuck. Um, hmm. I can just talk if the slides don't move. Try, yeah. try, try escape. Yeah. Okay. Well, ah. Maybe escape and reloading them or the Google slides. You could even share them in here and people can follow up on them. And okay. I can actually just send oh, wait. them. Oh, That's perfect. Here sure. we go. Okay. Here um, we go. Back. One of the things I really want to quickly say is trends for these conditions is that there's not probably not going to be the aging pathogen that every single person has. So the polymicrobial activity is really interesting. As in all of us acquire different pathogens, we are born with a microbiome environment that extends now beyond the gut into tissue and blood. Then we acquire different pathogens over the course of our lifetimes. That feeds into a polymicrobial picture of sort of how they can impact us. Worth keeping in mind. Next, the reason I got into the intersection of infection and aging is actually because of a condition that I'm not sure how many people know about. It's called myalgic encephalomitis chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS for short. This is an illness where young people regularly in their 20s get knocked down after an Epstein-Barr infection, mono, after a viral infection, usually traveling, something happens. A running model is they don't clear the infection well. The infection might get into the central nervous system or tissue and continues to provoke the patient. They get extremely ill to the point of being bedridden. And the crazy part is a lot of the symptoms of the illness are muscle pains, aches, trouble with exercise, um, cognitive problems. People, so many of these young patients say that it feels like they're 100 years old when they have this illness. Now, what, for example, cognitive dysfunction, it's called brain fog in this illness, but this is a woman who has this. She says, I went from being a company executive to barely reading over the fourth grade level when she got this illness. This other person said, I couldn't understand how to find anything. I couldn't write any email because I couldn't construct a sentence. So these patients often could develop decreased cognitive function and aches and pains. Now, what I've tended to notice is if someone's over the age of 65 and they get these symptoms, it's called aging. If, it's, if they get these symptoms before that, it's called something like MECFS. Now, what we did, and this was a couple years ago, we developed a basic treatment where we used a VDR, vitamin D receptor agonist, to stimulate the immune system to better target viruses, pulsed antibiotics to better wear down bacteria. We were able to help a lot of these people actually really, really, really improve. Now, that's a whole separate thing. This is a case history on that. So the whole thing is, if you can wear down microbial burden in a person, can you reverse aches, pains, cognitive symptoms, all kinds of issues? For example, one last example here is Chris Christopherson. His dementia ended up being Lyme disease. One of the organisms that Rudy and Rob uh, here at Harvard with the Brain Microbiome Project they're finding in Alzheimer's brains is Borrelia. So we just need to understand how much of what I'm interested in is with aging. There's a lot going on, but how much can we subtract from what we call aging by just these infectious mechanisms alone. And so that would basically be my, um, I could talk about this for 10 hours more. That's my quick take. Wow, that's wild. Okay, uh, thank you so, so much for jumping on and, and, and sharing this. I would love to get 
my hands on both of you guys' uh, slides so I can share them with everyone else afterwards. Sure. But for now, uh, and uh, we can make this as informal and as uh, interactive as possible. Please just feel free to unmute yourselves when I call on you. I think the first question was by Steve Fouts, so it was rather common to Cosmo. Uh, and then afterwards, we have Paul Spiegel, Quion, and Carl. Uh, so uh, please feel free to unmute yourself, Steve, if you have a comment to. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, one of the things that I've noted is that uh, viruses are associated with all the hypometabolic conditions that I've ever studied, and that this is um, common in Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune diseases, heavy metal poisoning cases, um, gut dysbiosis situations. And so I'm wondering to what extent the studies that are looking at specific viruses are too close to the issue and that if they were to study um, viruses on a broad basis, they would find that they're merely, um, or at least they're primarily opportunistic for a hypometabolic environment. Um, so I, so I, I don't know if I'll comment on the hypometabolic, well, maybe I will comment on the hypometabolic environment. Um, I think one of the key I think one of the thing, the key things I noticed in my in my PhD studies of type two diabetes is that insulin resistance is um, fundamentally driven in peripheral tissues by macrophages invading those peripheral tissues and entering a pro-inflammatory state, uh, suggesting that the immune system is effectively using these pro-inflammatory cascades to to instruct peripheral tissues to halt taking in glucose. Like, like that appears to be the direct mechanism. And I think that the hypometabolic state is the body's way of preventing intracellular pathogens from continuing to monopolize the body's energetic resources. Okay, uh, if any, I'm just writing this right now in the chat, but I'm really realizing I can just tell you. Guys, if any one of you would ever like to fill anything in that uh, we're discussing here, then just unmute yourself and join the discussion, okay? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, next one up, um, we can move. I think Paul had a question as well. Paul, do you want to unmute yourself? One second. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Cosmo, you've raised an interesting thought here. Um, for at least 30 years, we have had substantial success uh, addressing viral diseases like herpes, like uh, HIV, and a few others, um, using essentially well-known uh, antiviral therapies. Do you see a similar application of antiviral therapies for the diseases that you've mentioned? It seems like it could be such an easy way to start looking at these things. We've been doing it for decades. Oh yeah, well, I, I've been I've been trying to get my primary care physician to give me antivirals just for the hell of it, and he refuses to. Um, and I think one of Amy's slides actually made pretty clear uh, that there there have been studies showing that people on antivirals for herpes have lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease. You want to elaborate on that, Amy? Mute, mute, Amy. I can't hear you. Oh, huh. Okay, sorry. I didn't get to the slide, but I did have it um, there, which is just a, a Taiwan team found that the use of just anti-herpes medications for HSV, they, they tested people for herpes virus, followed up. Pretty sure there was a dramatic, um, dramatic uh, decrease in Alzheimer's development in the people who are just, this is almost people who are taking um, antiviral, antiviral drugs for HSV-1 general infection issues. So you, you almost, it was like such a low bar. I can share that study later. If uh, I remember, there's, yeah. it, it specifically, uh, they were only specifically patients that had a degree of lack of control of it. Like they had particularly severe cases of the infection. No, um, they actually were just patients. I think I have to look back at the study that tested positive for HSV for a herpes infection. Um, and they looked back over time and whoever had, had was positive for a herpes virus infection, there was a lower, I mean, an increased risk of that person developing dementia. And if that person had taken antivirals, um, then there was a lower um, they were less likely to develop Alzheimer's. I'd have to look into the specific numbers, though. That there, sounds like there, that. Yeah. There's a team at Mount Sinai, I think, that's just doing like the most basic study as well, just giving people with Alzheimer's, you know, um, valcite or something like that. That sounds, that sounds to me like that um, 
that sounds like an eerie echo of the metformin study where like the diabetics who got metformin ended up living longer than the non-diabetics who did not get metformin. Mm -hmm. And now everyone is like wringing their hands over the ethical implications of giving non-diabetics metformin when it seems like a no brainer. Similarly, giving non HSV one infected people, you know, a or whatever you're talking about. It seems like a no brainer, but of course it's going to take forever to give healthy people anything. Uh, aren't, there, aren't there a bunch of studies also showing that um, a long-term use of antivirals uh, degrades the immune, immune system? Uh, I can speak to that from a personal level. I was one of the original subjects in the valacyclovir studies back in the 80s, and I've been taking it regularly ever since. Uh, both, uh, and by the way, my friend, the physician who was running the study, uh, observed that it seems to have no side effects. And after 30, 35 years of taking this stuff, um, I've seen none whatsoever. Um, it's kind of yeah, like. But what have we seen, Paul? Huh? Who are you Paul, again? But Paul what turned have, out okay. But, but what have we seen, Paul? You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't recognize the face or the name. You're. Uh, uh, never mind. That was uh, crazy. Seriously, this, yeah, right, stuff, right. this stuff has absolutely no toxicity. It seems to be very clean. It's like metformin, which I'm also taking. If it does work for Alzheimer's and other diseases of aging, we're, we got something going here. There seems to be almost no downside to valcyclovir. I would agree. Patients with the condition, I mentioned ME-CFS, they often take antivirals for years at a time, and it does, does seems to help them, honestly, um, as opposed to, although we haven't really looked at the molecular biology closely, but certainly in those cases, it, it, it's a benefit usually. Great. And there are people on them for years. All right, great. Uh, I think next one up, we had uh, Carl and Kuyan with questions or comments. Well, I was asking, and somebody already linked the thing, I was asking if um, killing P16 cell uh, expressing cells is likely to have antiviral properties. Uh, Cosmo, comments? Or, or uh, that, that's, that's a really great question, but you know, I, I find it very peculiar that those that the, the, the P16 transgenic animals that were created and some of those fundamental uh, experiments. The, the way that they created those, those P16 transgenic animals is they, they genetically engineered a promoter that would respond to P16. And then the mechanism of death that they used to kill the animals was uh, overexpressing a thymidine kinase from a virus and then using an antiviral. So how about that for a confound? Well, you know, I guess my, part of my curiosity is, you know, uh, Ocean and, and John Lewis's Entos uh, have a platform for killing P16 expressing cells, which doesn't use, it doesn't have a virus involved, right? So will that show antiviral properties? It's an interesting, I, interesting. I think it might. I think it might prevent viruses from hijacking that mechanism of keeping the cell alive. I, I didn't really go into it, but it's in my very first blog post over two years ago. Part of this P16 pathway is it specifically overregulates mitochondrial metabolism. And it seems as if the virus is specifically doing this in order to maximize its own virility and reproduction. But my broader, comp my broader um, question to, to you and Amy or, or to everyone about all of this um, infectious stuff is, I think, you know, I think there's no question that you guys have presented the case and that there's ample evidence that these infectious agents, whether they're viral or fungal or whatever, can recapitulate many aspects of aging or cause some kind of damage in the body that causes people to seem like they're very, very old. Um, you know, Amy pointed out some of those yeah. ways. So the question is though, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's in question. The question is, is all aging really just a buildup of infectious diseases, even if, infectious agents, even if we don't now have a good catalog of what all of them are? I think there might be. And in fact, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to tag Mike Luxgard in, into this uh, chat as well. If he's still on the call, he wrote a whole book about this, basically postulating and giving a lot of evidence that, that the accumulation of microbial burden over time seems to capitulate a lot of diseases of aging. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, it's not all of it, but uh, germ-free mice are not immortal and they still age and die. Right. So, um, but uh, as Cosmo so, and Amy so beautifully pointed out, almost nobody's thinking about the, the other half of the equation to the human symbiote, right? So for, for the longest time, we've thought about, you know, uh, diseases like cardiovascular disease and cancer, stroke, 
Alzheimer's, et cetera, and just only looking at the human component of it. But as, as these guys, you know, so beautifully explained, there's a huge microbial component to all age related diseases. And, uh, um, yeah, it's only a matter of time before all of society sees that too. So that we'll have more research funding there. So. Yeah. Well, it'll undoubtedly turn out to be even more complicated than, than we currently suspect, which is more complicated than we currently suspected, you know, years ago. Um, I mean, okay. I have three or four quick ones for Cosmo or for anyone else first, and I'll go in reverse order to the order that I came up with them. So the most recent one based on the comment uh, of, 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 uh, um, uh, just a moment ago is I thought that there was an association with bacterial infections and heart disease. So maybe that's yet another thing and not yet another dysbiosis that's separate from the viral one. Yeah, but, I will, you know, that's a real interest of mine. Um, you know, and when I talk about polymicrobial, one of the things I think people can recognize is that a virus can support the survival of a bacterial organism, vice versa, right? Um, so for example, let's say you get an Epstein-Barr infection. It'll knock down the immune response. That might allow a bacterial pathogen to also proliferate. Then you have biofilm, which can be a conglomeration of different organisms interacting together. Um, first, it was thought that bacteria only contributed to biofilm, but there may be viral involvement, phage involvement in biofilm. So you can almost get the collective activity of different organisms um, as well into processes that imp impact diseases of the aging and maybe just aging itself. But in heart disease, chlamydia pneumonia is a fascinating pathogen that's regularly identified in atherosclerotic plaque. And one of the interesting things about it is in plaque, um, do you know what I mean by Warburg metabolism? Yes, of course. So why, what is the Warburg effect? This is something that drives, it's cancer. It drives granuloma formation. It drives, it's in atherosclerotic plaque uh, does this. So so many viruses, actually a lot of viruses and bacterial pathogens can actually basically hijack a cell and alter cellular metabolism in a way that results in a Warburg phenotype. And chlamydia pneumonia is one of those organisms. And what it does, it's, it, it's, there's actually papers that show it can alter, basically, the, it, it infects and then alters the metabolism of the cell. So the cell uptakes more glucose, excretes more lactate, and there's just a different metabolic environment, really conducive to the, like Cosmo mentioned, lipid droplet formation. Lipid droplets tend to form in macrophage foam cells, and chlamydia can actually use those as a source of nutrition and replication. So viruses use lipid droplets for replication purposes, um, but bacteria can also benefit from increased lipid in a cell. Um, as well for nutritional purposes and their own replication purposes. So there's a big trend with lipid um, and bacterial. And so then what that means is that bacterial and viral pathogens, sometimes there's actually functional redundancy in what they do, right? So sometimes people get hung up on like, this has to be a viral phenomenon or a bacterial phenomenon. But I've actually found that usually some of these different pathogens can do similar things. And last, you can throw parasites into the mix because one of the most fascinating ones is taxoplasma, for example. There's a huge proportion of the world harbors toxoplasma, which can get into the central nervous system. It can drive symptoms that are like schizophrenia and it loves lipid droplets. Toxoplasma also replicates with lipid and it can also modulate cell metabolism in a way that's similar to the way these viruses do to alter cellular metabolism. So you have these kind of conserved ways by which viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic pathogens can all dysregulate um, host gene expression, metabolism, and immunity in ways that can lead to these things. Yeah, I can't, it, I can't help but think that as, you know, we already know that like basic metabolism of a human cell is, you know, far, more, far more complex every time we look at it again. And now it turns out we have to understand the metabolism of, you know, the thousands of uh, symbionts and pathogens that live inside us as well as our own cells to really know what's going on. It's just, there's going to be a lot of work to do. Uh, okay. I'm going to say my other two questions quickly because this one generated a long talk and I don't want to have to... Uh, Kriyan, just real fast, it's not just sure. heart disease. There's lots of non-viral implication in Alzheimer's too. And like famously, Cort the company Cortexime has a billion dollar market cap going after the bacteria, the bacteria for gum disease uh, implication in Alzheimer's. Yeah, right. So it's obvious that it's like, it's the whole microbiome which is means it's like going to be a long time before we understand the, the real, the whole story here, but there's a lot of work to do and a lot of exciting discoveries to be made. Um, okay. So last, uh, so two quick ones, uh, again, inspired by Cosmo, but, but for whomever this, it seems like we're kind of screwed either way, Cosmo, because it sounds like one disease takes the macrophages and forces them into the M1 state and that's wrong. And the other disease forces them into the M2 state and that's wrong. So, you know, 
I guess that's just because it's something's you know, taking over some process for one purpose and another thing's doing it for another purpose. I just find that curious. But the thing I really wanted to ask is the, the, the nucleolus thing was very interesting to me. It could it be that by interrupting the cell cycle, the, the virus is interrupting some kind of error correction or cleanup of the nucleolus that would happen during cell division and hence allowing itself to just stay there in the nucleolus and do its thing and not get edited out because the process that was going to normally edit it out during cell division has been blocked. Great, Creon, that is a super brilliant observation. Um, for those of you on the call who don't know Creon, he is literally a rocket scientist and he has a long history of, of uh, making these huge leaps that are, that are, really brilliant in fields that he is not classically trained in. So I, I really appreciate that. also a Forsyth Senior <laughs> Fellow. Welcome, Creon. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so Creon, um, the, the, the G to S transition, that is, that is the canonical break of cellular senescence, that is the point of a cell's replication cycle where it is, it is about ready to copy its genome, but effectively what these pathogens are doing is they're preventing the copying of that, of that genome because they want all that energy and resources to copy their own genome, right? I hadn't thought of the nucleolus uh, as being something that itself also needs to divide during this mechanism. And you're absolutely right. That, that could be part of why they're inhibiting that transition. Uh, it occurs to me that we have this giant experiment going on right now with a huge number of people jumping onto this fad of, of like keto diets or whatever, which is shifting people's metabolism in one direction. Um, and does that, do you think that we could gather data from that somehow related to these metabolic shifts and how they affect these diseases? Anything that loves fat droplets is going to love my keto diet, huh? No. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, remember that, that the adenovirus 36 virus, which we, we now know, depending on what paper you read, uh, is found in up to 65% of obese people and only half as many um, non-obese people, right? We, we know that the adenovirus 36, we, we know how it works. We know that it hijacks fat cells to make them more lipogenic. And the way that that mechanism works is it hijacks the insulin receptor and uh, basically permanently turns on glucose uptake with respect to that fat cell. I have been hypothesizing for some time now that the reason that ketogenic diets work for weight loss is that it's specifically cutting off the glucose supply that allow these infected fat cells to grow out of control. And, and what, what is needed, I think, in the research is to assess whether or not ketogenic diets work better in people who, are, who have antibodies against the adenovirus 36. Mm -hmm. You know, with ketogenic diet, what's interesting is so you have uh, an impacted cell, the uptake is glucose, correct? Then the glucose is what ends up, you know, the TCA cycle, everything happens, then the output is lactate. Now, when you have something like all viruses modulate cell metabolism in order to replicate, they have to, they'll pull intermediates out of the TCA cycle in order to use those intermediates to better replicate. So what happens is if you prevent glucose uptake and the cells infected, then the virus can no longer take advantage of a lot of the cell, you know, it can't hijack the metabolism of the cell as effectively. There was a small study which actually found that, that maybe the ketogenic diet could help with influenza, possibly for those reasons. As in, it seems counterintuitive, but without glucose, the rest of the cellular metabolism cannot function correctly. So, and viruses and bacteria can then not take advantage of it. Do you follow let me, me say that? let me say something. Yes, I do. I mean, let me say something okay. about that, which reminds me of something I wanted to tell you, uh, okay. which it all wraps together. Yes, I was just recently boning up on metabolism, getting you know, getting a little smarter about it, and wondering, you know, why bother with the glucose cycle when you can use the fat? And what I learned was that, it, especially when the when the why bother with the glucose thing when you can do the um, the mitochondrial and produce a lot more ATP? Like, why bother with glycolysis when you can do oxfos? Right because oxfos is so much more efficient. Well, it may be more efficient at producing ATP, but oxfos doesn't produce any of these other intermediates that your cells need, particularly when they're dividing. Now this then, so that's exactly kind of what you were talking about, that the viruses force your cells to stay in the cycle where they're producing the intermediates that are necessary yes, for the viruses. For their sake, yeah. Uh, yeah. But here's the other thing that ties together exactly with what you were talking about before, about Warburg effect. Not only is the Warburg effect you know, uh, intimately tied in with cancer. 
Exactly. And and ketogenesis and like kind of anti-correlated with ketogenesis, how it is. <laughs> this is so interesting, and and Allison knows this well. Uh, there has been recent breakthrough work that is not anywhere near as well known as it should be on mammalian organ system regeneration. And the way you get mammalian organ systems to regenerate, like the way salamanders do and stuff like that, whole organ systems, limbs, hearts, nervous systems, everything, is you force them out of oxfos into aerobic glycolysis. And they, then the cells revert back to like a sort of more pluripotent form. And that's all how wound healing takes place as opposed to scarring. Okay. But you have to force the animal into that state. Normally a mammal won't do this. Okay. Normally it will just heal by scarring. But if you force it, if you force its cells back into um, glycolysis, then it will regenerate or approximately speaking. But that's very interesting because that's the Warburg effect. It's like you could call it cancer when the cell gets forced back to a pluripotent state and starts dividing like crazy, but it's kind of also exactly what you want if you want to initiate regeneration and redifferentiation of organ systems. So it's all tied together in an interesting way. I just want to briefly show you this, Creon. Can you guys see this? Yes. So this is the cell cycle. This, this is the spot right here where a cell becomes senescent. Oh, I'm sorry, this spot right here, the G to the S transition. This is where cellular senescence occurs. The cell cycle is also intimately linked with what mitochondria do. They, they actually form these large super networks where independent mitochondria come together and they enhance their mitochondrial metabolism at this location of the cell cycle. And then way over here, they split apart again. Right. And everyone knows that mitochondria are now considered part of the innate immune response, correct? Yeah. So well, wait, so no, explain that. I don't know really that. Cool videos where mitochondria will actually form around a uh, pathogen, intracellular pathogens. So mitochondria are now being defined. Mitochondria, the uh, hypothesis, which is generally accepted, is that they may have actually been derived from Akatsia, a kind of bacteria. And so there's already certain like competition between you have this <laughs> microbe that was sort of co-opted by a human cell and then forced into becoming part of, I guess, the human genome, right? As, as opposed to its own. Partially. But that, right. So it actually, right now, it, it, so many intracellular pathogen infection is so common that mitochondria, that I, I would have to find these videos. It was, I saw a fascinating video. Will actually are part of the innate immune response and they form they will like almost fractionate um, and form around a pathogen and become part of containing it. Cosmo, do you have any feedback more on that? I, I have never heard of this before, but it, it does surprise me. There's a couple me. papers I'll send out later on mitochondria being connected to innate immunity now where they might, it, it, yeah. They might be doing this just to create ROS around the intracellular well, pathogen. That is part, also, part of what they do, yeah. I'd, I'd also like to insert a comment here about <laughs> cell senescence and, and cell cycling as being um, dependent upon the underlying redox conditions of the, of the body. And if you've got high hydroxyl radical production going on in the environment, it's completely unsafe to do uh, DNA replication and, and, and cell cycling. And um, the antioxidant defense system that's defending the redox potential, that's coming off the Krebs cycle. It's not coming from the uh, oxfos. Yeah. Mm. That makes, that ties right in with this idea that you go out of oxfos and into Krebs for not just replication, but for actual redifferentiation, and 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 that also viruses would try and co-opt that to replicate themselves. There's a lot of excitement in the anti-aging space lately uh, about this this phenomenon of partial reprogramming, um, which has brought people to think about uh, the reprogramming process in general and making induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which is a, a far uh, like a complete programming version of it, but. Uh, what seems to be interesting is partial reprogramming. But uh, what I read in a paper recently uh, was, was that in order for this Yamanaka cellular reprogramming to even work, first there is a stage where mitochondria have to uh, break down. Um, um, a huge number of them have to be eaten by, by uh, uh, you know, a, a phagocytosis process, internal, um, um, until their numbers get down low enough that the metabolism switches over and then reprogramming can happen. So that's another link. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. No, 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 no. You know, Cosmo, before I forget, did you see it's a paper from Tony Kos, why, I don't know how to pronounce his name, at Stanford, 
Vice um, Gray, we, we should have totally had him on the Vice call. Gray, there you go. <laughs> I know David Gatemore, who's on the other author, but um, so we they found that you see the lipid droplets in the aging brain. Yeah, kind of microglia in the aging brain seem to have lipid droplets that. I don't know. I mean, that if you think about, for example, again, in MECFS, that condition I study, um, there's been only two autopsies of patients, but both have found enteroviruses in the brain of the patients. Enteroviruses love lipid droplets. Again, you said uh, hepatitis C was one of the few viruses that, you know, benefits off lipid droplets, but so do the enteroviruses. They use them as replication platforms as well. So when you actually think that 50% of glia in the aging brain may have lipid droplet and you wonder why that's happening, um, then it, again, it correlates with, you know, altered cell metabolism, the cells may be hijacked and that's why they overcreate a uh, lipid that's more conducive to the survival of an intracellular pathogen. A brief, then, hmm. brief point of clarification though. Uh, lipid yeah. droplets, lipid droplets are inside the cell. And right. uh, I, I can tell you from conversations of habit, Joe DeRisi at the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, yeah. you know, he, he confirms that, yeah, viruses of all kinds love lipid droplets inside the cell. The, yeah. the hepatitis C thing I was talking about is LDL particles outside. Yeah, the that's cell. fair. Similar, different. You're right. No, that was more specific mechanism. But I do think that was interesting. Um, just because lipid droplets are found in the foam cells and atherosclerotic plaque, they're found in granuloma, where you also have this Warburg trend. So I definitely think there's a chance in simple terms that these cells, Warburg, for example, where you someone was alluding to, a Warburg metabolism is is how it's how most immune cells activate or how most cells in the body function normally. They need to change the cell metabolism. For example, that's how T cells activate. Um, they have to switch their, in order to more rapidly generate ATP for the energy to activate. They will induce a temporary Warburg phenotype, right? That's normal. Warburg doesn't have to be abnormal. But when is, there's a perpetual uh, Warburg state that becomes detrimental to the host, as in cancer, or with granuloma, that might mean that a pathogen has hijacked the cell and is keeping the cell in a perpetual Warburg state so that it can begin to benefit from the intermediates um, that are uh, of the cell. Um, it can begin to use the, the TCA cycle and other intermediates that are part of this. Um, when I say TCA cycle, by the way, that might be a little confusing because classic Warburg just refers to a complete switch to aerobic glycolysis, but now lately, um, people have shown that some of the TCA cycle intermediates might still be involved. All right. I actually have a paper about this coming out. So yeah, please send everything make it more clear. Uh, I, think, I think the way that the resource sharing could be done best is like in the email that I sent out to the whole group about this call today, just share all the, the documents and data about this call and, uh, yeah. and you know, then I don't have to play it. And uh, we have two more questions oh. by James uh, and Steve. And then I would love um, for you, Cosmo and, and Amy, maybe to close it out by saying, okay, if we now know that information, well, what to do with it, uh, you know, in the context of COVID-19, like what are potential steps ahead, um, you know, if, if, if we can coordinate on this info. Okay, um, James, you sure. can unmute yourself. Hey guys, now. James Pyre here. Um, so this has been an interesting discussion so far about a whole series of hypotheses about how both viruses and bacteria could um, help promote the various age-related diseases. One of the things that I'm curious about though, is that in my reckoning of our existing model of how we understand the relationship of, of aging diseases and, and infectious agents, it, it already kind of fits in the existing model, not with the hacking metabolism sort of hypotheses that we've been mostly talking about today, but instead in an inflammatory model, right? The recognition of these viruses and bacteria and bacterial uh, particles by TLRs and various other pathogen associated molecular patterns. So given that the existing model already explains the correlation, many of the correlations that you've, uh, that we've talked about here, not, not the date, not the metabolic data, but the overall age related disease correlation, how do you design an experiment that can disaggregate those two that can show a metabolic effect from these, uh, viral pathogens according to the hypotheses you've articulated versus the general inflammation PAMP mediated effects that are already in our models of aging. Cosmo, I can't hear Cosmo. Can you guys hear, Amy, can you hear Cosmo? 
Sorry, I had my I had my mute button. I, I live next to a hospital, so I keep muting myself every time a stupid ambulance goes by for your benefit. Uh, all right, so I'll I'll tell you the I'll tell you the experiment I've really wanted to run for some time now. Uh, in, in cardiology, there is substantial focus on uh, uh, lipids or, or lipidomics as as a core biomarker of people's heart disease risks. So quite regularly in the doctor's office, you go in to get blood drawn. They measure the LDL and HDL fraction in your blood. And in some really advanced experiments, they can measure a full spectra of the sizes of the individual LDL particles that you have. And those, those bad cholesterol particles have now been, ha have now been split into uh, high risk and low risk LDL particles, as, as you've probably heard. What really needs to be done is people with different cardiovascular risk scores and even cardiovascular calcification scores, they need to have their blood drawn and sequencing needs to be done on those cholesterol particles to see what viruses are actively circulating in people's uh, lipid particles in their blood. Doesn't that still not answer the question? Because if we think that, that those cardiovascular risk factors are caused by inflammation induced by PAMP detection of the viruses in the particles versus uh, a different hypothesis for how uh, the viruses are actually, you know, doing something to the macrophages. Like it doesn't seem to get at distinguishing those two hypotheses from a causal uh, causal relationship perspective. Uh, um, can you can you word that again? And uh, what what are the two um, things that we need to distinguish? So so we've talked today not about chronic activation of inflammatory pathways in the immune system, which is already part of our concept of aging. And, and many of the things that you've talk, talked about, the, the correlations and with Alzheimer's, et cetera, they could all be interpreted very simply as contributing to this inflammaging phenotype that we already think drives many diseases of aging. The hypotheses that you guys are proposing here are a series of different things unrelated to inflammaging. But the, hypothes the, the hypotheses I've heard for testing these things so far fit in, in both worlds, right? Like giving antivirals, for example, would help if you were a part of the inflammaging hypothesis or part of the, I'm just kind of called it a, a met, um, metabolic hacking hypothesis that we've mostly been talking about today. And so I'm curious if, if you want if we want this hypothesis about metabolic hacking and various other things that these viruses are doing to enter the aging field in a big way, there has to be some sort of killer experiment that can say, no, it's not just the inflammaging, um, the inflammaging phenotype. It's something else that is causally happening here. Um, that's contributing to these phenotypes. Right. And I, I think, I think the point I'm bringing forward is that, most people think of this inflammaging as inflammation caused by aging. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's inflammation caused by literal pathogens. And I think that the core experiments that need to be done are, are, are more systematic uh, demonstrations that said pathogens uh, are found much more frequently in people with these actual endpoint diseases of aging. And should I would it, disagree it, with you. Shouldn't it be easy in mice, right? Shouldn't you be able to infect mice and distinguish these two cases relatively easily? Well, I mean, in, in, in terms of obesity, we've definitely done that with adenovirus 36. Uh, um, I think that's starting to be done with herpes and Alzheimer's in mice, actual herpes infections. And what, I, what I've seen is brain organoids in particular. Um, so the, the question I have is, um, maybe you've covered this, but I, I may have missed it, is why do, if, if the concern is that diseases of aging are the result of infection with pathogens, why should they become more common with age? Um, you have a linearly increasing exposure to pathogens as you just like have more years to get exposed, but you have, um, you don't have a linear increase in the, in the diseases of aging. It, it accelerates. So what's going on there? I think what might be going on there is, is different pathogens taking different footholds during this fundamental battle. And I think that a big portion of why they increase with age is that as soon as you get enough pathogens actually screwing up your immune system, then other pathogens can come in. So it's, it's, it's the pathogens that rewire the immune system and turn off their M1 pro-inflammatory response. The Those cascade are the ones that I want to, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's cascade and it's, uh, it's uh, the, the individual pathogens helping each other in terms of destroying the immune response and then letting the other ones in the door.
Totally. There's a good study by Mark Davis's team at Stanford where they looked at, at uh, monozygotic twins. One had CMV, or some twins had CMV, some didn't. And they looked at the impact of CMV positive twins just on a range of immune parameters. And in the twins that harbored CMV, they're, they're drastically, have a drastically different immune, immune parameters than the twin that doesn't, right? So each, each acquired virus or each acquired pathogen shapes the immune response um, in a way that the next acquired pathogen may have more ability to, usually, unfortunately, they knock down the immune response, right? So a common thing, for example, like HIV would be the, the, the easiest example. HIV just comes in and knocks down CD8 T cell count, right? Then as we know in HIV, then the person begins to acquire all kinds of other co-infections, right? So they have problems with fungal infections and this and other issues and bacterial infections. And then generally speaking, if you look at the microbiome ecosystems of someone with HIV, the gut microbiome becomes completely dysbiotic and actually adenoviruses in the gut will reactivate. Then the gut becomes leaky and then those organisms may better get in the blood and then the blood brain barrier may become more permeable. So you have this cumulative effect where you need a one dominant pathogen that can dysregulate the immune response um, and also human gene expression to a point that creates an atmosphere where the next one can better survive. And also all the ecosystems of organisms in and on us already, they, all organisms in the human, almost all of them are what are called pathobionts. Do you guys know that term? Pathobiont means that it can be, an organism can be commensal or it can change its gene expression to act as a pathogen under conditions of inflammation and stress, anything, right? So what that means is that in one person, there, for example, P. gingivalis, the organism that we're talking about that was found in the Alzheimer's brain, that's, it's also a major drival of, of tooth decay. It is found on healthy teeth. The issue is that when teeth move toward periodontitis progression, it begins to express virulence factors, biofilm signaling molecules, other ish stuff, and it pulls the other organisms in the tooth into acting with it in a way that begins to drive problems, right? So you basically have all you need is sort of an infection with one organism, and that begins to create a, a better um, environment for the others. And one of the things I'll just add there before I stop is that the, the microbiome that we're born with sets us up for that. And so when Cosmo mentioned earlier, the health of the mother, that is a key trend that aging and what may affect us in life, the, the organisms, there's a huge debate on whether infants get seeded in the womb by organisms. Some teams are finding organisms in the womb, some aren't. There may actually be seeding of the fetus in the womb. It's a debate. Even then, there's a breast milk microbiome where for months, the mother, all the organisms that seed the infant's gut come largely from breast milk, from the mother to the child. So you get set up with the organisms in you for life from largely the mother, but there's even contributions from sperm. The father, there's a sperm microbiome now, right? So the organisms, those are the ones you start with. Then when you accumulate other pathogens over time from exposures, this, all of what you began with um, can also be modulated by their activity as well. So it kind of feeds into this whole picture of how organisms affect you, starting from the womb. All right. Well, can you can really I uh, add that we have a couple of populations of people who would probably be happy to uh, volunteer themselves uh, for looking at the time course of the, all these different variables. Um, one of them would be um, intravenous vitamin C um, patients where you're flooding the body with vitamin C so that you're restoring a kind of redox potential control without interfering with the immune system's ability to generate hydroxyl radicals in response to um, antigen presentation mechanisms and stuff like that. And so you can look to see in these patients what happens to their viral loads and what happens to their inflammatory markers um, once you initiate um, a massive load of vitamin C. Um, also, uh, ketosis. I mean, it's very simple for people to volunteer to be ketotic in certain environments and look to see what's the time course of all of these other inflammatory and infectious vectors um, to sort out, you know, what is it that's the primary cause versus the opportunistic uh, cause. Well, that's a nice segue into, you know, how can we use the short-term opportunities in COVID uh, to to get some uh, some work done on this, uh, you know, I think I mean this would be more like a citizen science project, I'm assuming. But uh, let's hear it maybe from Keith, and I would love to hear from everyone else on the call, starting maybe with 
uh, with co not everyone, but anyone who thinks who, uh, who, who has something to say on this, starting with Cosmo and, and Amy as well. And like, what, what do you think can be done right now uh, to push this further? But Keith, uh, uh, lead us into it. Sure. Uh, thanks, Allison. And thanks for putting this all together. This has been great so far and uh, very fascinating, Cosmo. Um, so what I'm about to say is sort of a follow on to what Aubrey was saying in the email thread before the conversation started, in that one thing that we've been finding with our outreach efforts at Lifespan.io uh, Lifespan in this current COVID situation is that there's a narrative advantage of linking infectious diseases with aging because people perceive it as, as an assault on them to be corrected rather than you know, the inevitability of chronic diseases. So this COVID-19 situation is presenting an opportunity to get the ear of politicians and, and mainstream press in a way that I don't think we've been able to do so before. And uh, we've been having some success, you know, getting some press appearances to talk about, uh, you know, curing aging or aspects of aging as a means of mitigating, uh, you know, infectious diseases like this. And, and people have much less pushback on that. Uh, but as per this conversation, uh, this is creating like a fascinating flip side of that argument in going after viruses as a way to mitigate all the other diseases of aging. So I think, you know, that's going into my memory banks as that allows us to basically create an even stronger, like multiple birds with one stone argument to make to say that not only can we, uh, you know, socioeconomically mitigate the damage of future pandemics by addressing the root causes of aging. Also, by addressing the viruses themselves, it will also help address, uh, you know, aging. And then it's like a virtuous cycle. And I think if we can package that up in the right way, we can get, you know, some movement behind some sort of legislation for an increased budget uh, to the NIH or doing these sort of low hanging fruit trials that have been discussed. You know, why don't we look at existing therapies uh, with the indication of, you know, reducing, you know, viral load or indication of slowing down aging? Um, Cause I think that can happen right now. We just need the right, you know, hot button trigger to be able to leverage uh, politicians and press uh, to, to harp on that issue. And I think we can, we can use that. Uh, specifically, actually, I was talking about this recently with Aubrey David Sinclair, Tina Woods, who's on the call here. Um, I think it's a perfect time to resurrect the, the older idea of the longevity dividend uh, that J. L. Shansky and Dana Goldman were putting forth in 2013 and before. And that didn't really go as far as it could have back in that time in you know, 2013 and 2006 when it was first raised, because I think no one really believed it was even possible. But now with recent studies that are showing like you know, maybe we can get some like Greg Faye's uh, study showing that potentially we can reverse uh, immune system decline. I think by having that component plus what was already there with the longevity dividend of you know the socioeconomic uh, advantages of working on this coupled with additional components of what are the what are the what's the value of mitigating pandemics like this you know and the economist Andrew Scott was showing that if we just had a younger population like we had in 1918 or you know, the immune systems of younger people, uh, we, the death rate would be 30% what it is right now in this current situation and lockdowns would be half as long. So I think that creates political opportunities for us. That's basically, you know, I've talked a lot. So hopefully some of that made sense. Thank you. Cosmo, Amy, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I think there's two points. Um, maybe this is just obvious, which is that if you look at the COVID cases, the ones that end up um, more severe and in the ICU, um, you always see this underlying conditions, older with underlying conditions. Okay, so if we keep studying those and we could fix those issues, then maybe everyone would just have a mild case of COVID and it wouldn't really be such a big deal, right? So I, what I don't understand is a lot of research actually shut down, I'm in Boston, on, for example, hypertension. But hypertension is one of the biggest risk factors for for death from COVID. So we need to keep studying those things so that we can, you know, keep people out of the ICU and from getting really, really bad. Second, I think there's an interesting debate if you look at the treatments that are being proposed for COVID, which is what works in early stage disease, what works in late stage disease in the ICU, and what actually might be used as a preventative, right, prophylactically. And so there, you know, hydroxychloroquine, huge debate. I actually see evidence that it may work early, early, early on, but everyone keeps testing it later, right? Um, so 
one of the things with aging is that what we need people to understand is we want to intervene before um, things get really bad. This is what my experience when it comes to treating uh, viral or any kind of infection, persistent infection in a patient, it's much harder to get rid of it when, think, when the organism is spread through your tissues than it is to prevent it in early stage from replicating, from being able to get out there, right? So it does also the COVID issue, like we can push for the idea of prevention, um, which could, again, help people visualize that they don't want to end up in the ICU on a ventilator in the first place, that kind of same mentality. So the billion dollar question as it relates to uh, coronavirus and aging is vaccination. And obviously, there's a massive push for vaccination for you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Just as SARS-CoV-2 infection is most lethal depending on your age, if you're, right, obviously I don't have to explain to everybody here, if you're 80 years old or older, you're more likely to die relative to young age groups. So uh, when you consider these other microbes that affect aging and age-related diseases, whether it's CMV or, uh, or herpes viruses with Alzheimer's disease, you know, pick, pick your favorite one. Um, there is, there, it, it's either been very difficult to develop a vaccine for it. CMV, there's been 40 years of research and there still is, isn't a CMV vaccine. But what I should point out is one of the leading, you know, uh, one of the companies that's actually going after a coronavirus vaccine, Moderna, uh, they actually have a, and they're entering phase three clinical trials for that in July. So they're way ahead of everybody else on this. Um, they've actually gotten development of CMV vaccine. So if you want to flip the coronavirus situation into this idea of microbes and aging, vaccination, and just to take it a little further back too, 100, about 100 years ago, average lifespan was 40 years old. And one of the components that helped extend lifespan to almost double you know, to where it is now, one component was vaccination. You know, so you reduce uh, and almost completely eliminate early mortality. And now mo most of us are able to live double the lifespan. I see a similar effect happening if we could... Uh, immunize against CMV, herpes viruses, and, you know, again, pick your poison, back, you know, viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever. But yet there's no push for that. So I see this as a billion dollar plus question. I also don't think, just to beat this to death, that it's a coincidence that people like uh, Bill Gates are now heavily in the vaccination field because they see this, you know, whether it's a pandemic or it's age-related diseases, I see this as a huge opportunity and it isn't being talked about at all. So if there are yeah. VCs that are interested, uh, that's where we need to go. Yeah, on the flip side of that same question of vaccinations, another point that's worth making that I put in the chat um, is that obviously vaccines, whatever they may be for COVID or whatever in the future, they're going to be less efficacious for the elderly. Yep. And everyone's always like saying, oh, we just got to get to a vaccine. We just got to get to a vaccine. So there's, there's another opportunity for us to say, hey, if you want that vaccine to work, we got to work on this stuff. But isn't, older there, isn't there an additional problem? It's the last thing I'll ask in that actually the, some substantial fraction of the microbiome and the virome and all these kinds of things, you know, may actually be doing something neutral or even good. And so what we certainly can't expect, even if we, so what we certainly may not desire, even if we could expect it, which I doubt we could, is something that will like rid all, you know, rid us of all viruses. Like that might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It might be like kill all insects because we don't yeah. like the pests, you know? Yeah, you obviously can't do that. But for things like, you know, herpes viruses that are found in the brain or candida that's found in the brain that are in locations that they shouldn't be, <laughs> these would seem to be the obvious, obvious, you know, uh, uh, vaccines to go after first. You can't, you can't, we can't completely wipe out microbes. There's no way we could do that, whether in us or on Earth. We're, they outnumber us by a factor of, you know, 10 to the 30th to 1. So that's impossible well, unless we and live also, on Mars. Also, agriculture would immediately collapse yeah, as with everything too. else, you know. Sure, that too, right. So, we, you know, we've got to vaccinate ourselves against the ones that affect our physiology. Okay, that's but do you, do you think it might also be possible that there's something else at play here? And what I mean is that we are, from what I understand, like bombarded by trillions of viruses every day. Now, most of them aren't human infected or even microbiome infectors, but like the virome is everywhere. There's more viruses than anything else by like yeah. a large margin. And might it be, this is a topic for another uh, session, Allison, you know, I'm obsessed with this. Mightn't it be that there are some other things that are, you know, with all due respect, Cosmo, some other things that are wrong with people's metabolisms for other reasons that cause them to become susceptible to these viruses in the first place, which then wreak havoc. Like, like genomic markers that, that uh, 
like the top genomic marker of obesity being a gene that regulates viral propagation. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah, there are th right. maybe there are things that come before the viruses do chronologically and, and turns out genomic risks. Or so like the classic example is smallpox, you know, which was so devastating and hurt so many people and all this. And we just think it's all the virus, but it's like, maybe there were societal dietary and other factors that made people susceptible to it. I don't know. So it's a probability based thing, right? When you have right. so many microbes on earth, you know, there are going to be certain microbes that affect certain people and certain microbes that affect others. But it, we're just by sheer magnitude, right? Just from a probability based standpoint, um, there are going to be microbes that affect or don't affect and different people, like you said, for different reasons. So sure, identifying the factors are important, but, you know, global immunization for microbes that affect people during aging, I think is a huge priority and it isn't being talked about. So. All right. Anyone else would like to come out here with? Uh, well, with yeah. How about hotspots? Um, you know, we had coronavirus hotspots in various places in the world, and everybody's still attributing all of these hotspots to coronavirus instead of to confounding variables in those regions. So uh, there's some lack of rigor in the way in which the public health issues are being um, considered and presented. I hate to beat it to death, but vaccination solves that problem. You know, independent of diet or vitamin C or vitamin D, pick your poison. If you can train the immune system, whether it's through immune rejuvenation, which is a separate issue from vaccination, but if you can vaccinate everybody, you can eat whatever you want, basically, and not die from coronavirus, right? Well, Michael, so, I think it's very clear that the coronavirus pandemic is accelerating vaccine research and development, yeah. right? We're yeah. going gonna to have RNA vaccines and maybe DNA vaccines faster yeah. than we otherwise would have. Yeah, just, like we, right. just so, like we did for AIDS. So to the extent to which you are right that we should vaccinate against these age-related infectious pathogens, then I think that will, ex that will bring that forward because we'll have the tools ready faster. Yeah. But I don't see a message in your vaccine, vaccine, vaccine message of, of something that a community like this should do right away to accelerate that faster? Is there some specific action item in the short term that you recommend? Yeah, hundred percent. And anybody that knows me and what I, what I, what I talk about all the time follows my blog. I'm always talking about diet and fitness because obesity, I hate to say it independent of genetics. It's also been associated with an increased risk. So there are obvious, you know, diet and lifestyle related factors that can minimize your risk for getting coronavirus. But uh, again, vaccination, I mean, you can't, you know, what are we going to do with the 80 year olds that are in that are in senior living, you know, and that are we going to put, you know, put them on special diets and, and give them a treadmill when they can barely move? I mean, uh, vaccine for that population is, is essential, right? So yeah, but vaccines are too short. Uh, it's, right. it's not the right time frame for vaccines uh, to, to the ones that we've done so far for coronaviruses have failed miserably. And there are all these unanticipated cross vaccine problems that are showing up that we really do not understand. All right, so, so antibody, know, antibodies uh, too. Companies uh, like Regeneron are going after antibody treatment or convalescent serum. There's gotta be something that's gonna, you know, whether it's vaccines or other. Well, there's also, there's also right. small molecule compounds. So I, I wanna take the opportunity to, uh, I don't know, uh, Larry Callahan is on the call. I don't know if he wants to unmute himself and, and speak, but I totally invite him to. He's head of the global substance registration system at the Federal uh, Drug Administration. And I'd love to have his input on this particular matter. You there, Larry? I still see him as participants. Oh. Amy, why don't you go to him? All right. <laughs> uh, I just had a quick thought, which is that, you know, I'm not against the vaccine idea, but one of the things that I've always thought about is that if you support the immune system itself, the immune system can figure out what pathogens it should target, right? So if you can general immune support means that let's say we can keep T cell activity up in people when it might otherwise diminish, then those T cells can respond to the individual threats that each person might acquire. It could maybe be a herpes virus in one person. It could be a different virus in someone else, right? So immune support also correlates with aging prevention in that sense of you can have specific vaccines, but if you, if you keep people's immune systems in better shape starting from the beginning of life, the immune system itself can figure out better how to keep microbial burden down, right? So that's one thing that could also be a topic. And the second thing's a little off topic, but what with the adenovirus vector vaccines, um, Cosmo, are you like, adeno, is it the case that if you already have immunity to an adenovirus, it won't work as well for you? 
<laughs> Oops. Because adenoviruses, one of the things I've noticed is adenoviruses are being found more and more in correlation with human disease. For example, there's a recent tumor microbiome studies or tumor viral studies, and adenoviruses are big tumor associated viruses. You are just implicating adenoviruses in obesity. Um, adenoviruses are some of the first viruses that expand in HIV and AIDS in the gut. So I know we're attenuating them, but it, are, if, are we underestimating already how our bodies may, because whenever I hear a vaccine developer mention adenovirus, they go, oh, it's a virus that causes a common cold, but it seems like adenoviruses are doing way more. Yeah, so, so a bit of a history lesson. Adenoviruses are named after the adenoids. Adenoids are another word for tonsils. It turns mm -hmm. out that people who are obese generally have their tonsils removed due to an early serious infection of the tonsils. Mm -hmm. Hey, Larry's yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I had my phone on mute. I unmuted the uh, the screen, but I still have my phone on mute. I apologize for that. Yeah, there are you know there are a lot of small molecules in in trials now. Uh, of course, from Zinsevir, you know, had kind of mediocre effects, but the only effects we see. And there's also a drug from Fuji, Fambivir. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but but it, the Russians have claimed it has very good efficacy. The other thing that we've looked at a little bit are some of the um the the um. The, the basically uh, H2 receptor inhibitors. Um, and the H2 receptor inhibitors are interesting. I mean, famotidine, which is actually something called an inverse agonist, so it actually sends a negative signal um, that histidine would send in the, it seems to be fairly effective in preventing, you know, bad disease, at least that's by hypothesis. And there's a study going on up in New York and Northwell, some of you may be familiar with it. There's also been you know, a lot of anecdotal evidence that if you take uh, famatidine uh, early on in the infection, it will, um, it will cause the infection to resolve faster and you won't end up with, you know, very severe symptoms. And there's a couple of instances of that. One of the things that histidine does, um, or histamine does, it sort of makes your neutrophils go a little bit crazy or senescent. And, um, you know, so they don't really know where to go and they might get accumulated in the lungs. And, and it also, it also may make um, may make your endothelial cells. Uh, there's this whole Brady Kynan uh, Brady Kynan uh, you know um, you know pathway that may be involved in some of the pathogenesis of um, of, um, of of COVID. It's it's the it's the short Brady Kynan one through nine. I think that one's not the full length one. That the ACE two, which is also the receptor, but is a is also a a, a protease. That it, it's it, it's a um it's a uh, it's a it's a, it's a, a terminal protease that cleaves off. I think on the gamma carboxy end cleaves off an amino acid and, and it inactivates some of the Brady Kynan and collidin um, peptides. And that unfortunately there's no there's no um, there's no drug for the um, for the Brady kinin um, I think it's the Brady kinin one receptor two receptor which this thing interacts with and there were some drugs under development for pain for that but they never went further and may, maybe they'll be resuscitated because Brady kinin's probably involved in a lot of pathogenicity and a lot of different things and and by you know t toning it off with you know these receptor inhibitors. Um, there may be some hope in that. I, I know Merck had one. I think Sanofi had one. They were going for pain, but again, it, it, you know, um, it, it may be something that you can tone down. And I don't know if they're going to rejuvenate some of their some of their drugs or not. Uh, and uh, you know, but on the on the hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine thing, I mean, hydroxychloroquine's always been out there as kind of this great hope for for viruses, and it, you know, it inhibits a lot of viruses in in, in the test tube, but it really hardly ever works in in in, in man, because I mean, there's just so much to acidify all your lysosomes to an effect where you're going to really have an antiviral effect, I think is, is pretty unlikely. And um, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's always been sort of pushed forward for, you know, for influenza or you show in, in activity in a test tube. I mean, I used to run the HIV database at, a, at uh, NIAD and, um, you know, the, the, it, it showed effect in that too, but it, it would never do anything. Uh, when you go in vivo because the, you know, the body's just too big and you can't, it, it works very good in blood cells and things like that to stop uh, malaria, but it doesn't really work uh, any, any, any place else. So, yeah. That sounds like a ton of non-vaccine options. And I'm, I'm glad that the number of options is going up as every time I talk. Yeah. To you. Well, I, I, yeah, have, it, it, I have a um, COVID-19 plus aging meta comment, um, which relates to a vitamin a uh, really important vitamin for our ecosystem is funding. Uh, and right now there's a lot of uh, money floating around um, and, and grants 
going out uh, to people to explore things like that. So one thing I could just encourage this community to do is, is uh, apply for a bunch of different grants from various different granting bodies um, with the right keywords um, with related to COVID in them. And um, people getting funded in the community is really helpful for them and, and being able to move stuff forward. I don't know who the granting, the perfect granting bodies are to apply to, um, but that could potentially be um, maybe a little list that we could make up as a resource for this community. Yeah, well, I would like to ask you guys, who here has applied to a specific grant uh, due to COVID uh, using the nice uh, keywords that Joe suggested already? Anyone... I have. <laughs> you have? Okay, anyone else here on this call who has applied? Okay, but I make that an action item from the call that um, uh, we can maybe crowdsource a list of, you know, uh, grants that went through and why they went through. Um, okay, anyone else uh, who would like to come up with a way in which we can currently accelerate? Um, I mean, Larry, Larry, if you know anybody over at like the Mint, you know, in town, I mean, that might be like really useful. <laughs> well, there's a lot of money being tossed around and, you know, it, it's, you know, how, how much of it will be productive is always, you know, questionable. But I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of effort. I mean, FDA really is changing the way it's looking at things. I mean, some of the RNA vaccines, some of the problems that we'll probably see is that, as you know, RNA is really unstable. You know, you, you, you know, there's RNAs all over the place. I mean, to, um, you know, and then, and, you know, to, to, to make it a you know something that you can use widely is going to be challenging and 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 we'll see it's also you know some of the things it's it's probably very expensive to make right now too and uh, you know the adenovirus vaccines I, I think the Oxford group went with the monkey one that humans may not have seen but um, uh, Amy was right I mean a lot of times with the adenovirus I mean what we found out in cystic fibrosis when they used adenoviruses uh, you had very serious immune responses um, against the adenoviruses that caused a lot of uh, pathology so you have to make sure you use one that isn't uh, that really hasn't been seen that much before and the other problem with the vaccine too is that we're still not sure whether um, there's antibody dependent enhancement of, of infection I mean it doesn't look like it from some of the convalescent plasma data but that's always a concern I mean like the dengue virus you know the second time around you get it it's always much worse so I mean those are the the kind of things you have to look out for and whether, again, what's the correlates of protective? Is it a T cell response or is it a, uh, an antibody response is always something that's uh, up for debate for influenza. I don't think we know what the real correlates of protection if there are any uh, for that yet and, and things like that. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, okay. We had uh, Steve want to say one thing on vitamin D or did you just want to say vitamin D? <laughs> No, no. Well, it was it was about the issue of uh, strategic approaches to funding and the institutional resistance to dealing with non pharmaceuticals and generic substances and very inexpensive therapies. And that um, I would put my money on vitamin C, um, in intravenous vitamin C infusions, as a way of restoring cytokine signaling pathways and and uh, optimizing immune responses and things like that. But there's a massive resistance to vitamin C in the institutions regulating public health today. So my suggestion would be vitamin D. Vitamin D made the transition from fringe quackery to mainstream medicine in about a decade, which is the fastest of anything that I've seen along those lines. And we know in the elderly that kidney function uh, decreases in the activation of vitamin D. So why not look at vitamin D supplements in the elderly regarding coronavirus as a good example to leverage the concept of anti-aging? One thing um, that I would add about vitamin D is, you know, I worked on vitamin D for a lot in my undergrad work or grad, and the vitamin D receptor is really what matters, don't you think? Activity of the receptor itself, the vitamin D nuclear receptor? Well, you've got the activation of vitamin D in the liver, or excuse me, in the liver and the kidney, but it's the kidney function part of that process that appears to be selectively inhibited in the elderly. And so that can be directly addressed by supplementation, which is incredibly inexpensive and easy. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Because also the receptor itself is what controls parts of the innate immune response, right? So you have thousands yes. of genes under the receptor control, yeah. including catalysin, right? Which is one of the right. body's most potent antimicrobial peptides. So key really, and I don't think it's been totally determined, is how to improve vitamin D receptor function in addition to just supplemental vitamin D. There's debate on whether it is a total agonist of the VDR. You have 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and then the 25D form, right? 125 right. dihydroxy vitamin D is actually more of a VDR agonist. That's right. Um, and that so, nuclear transcription factor drives exactly. those so what you really want to do, mechanisms. Yeah. Which is yeah. almost really, to me, one of the most undertapped things to keep the innate immune system in good shape is to keep activity of the vitamin D nuclear receptor um, in shape. Um, and if you could stack it with autophagy by, yeah. let's say, protein-restricted diets with some kind of MCT fat for energy, you yeah. can hedge that bet in a couple of ways to um, maybe get the kind of results that would then allow us to pursue a vitamin D, vitamin C combination mm -hmm. therapy for the elderly. So, so for those who don't know, I wrote what I believe is probably the most comprehensive review article on vitamin D and COVID-19 early Indeed. In from preprints. And uh, if anyone wants to talk about vitamin D for COVID-19 specifically, please talk to me or go find my review, which is not hard to find. Uh, but to your point about making the transition in public awareness to not quackery, there's still a huge... Um, resistance to vitamin D and there's massive numbers of articles coming out saying stupid things and not recognizing the data and pointing to flawed studies and over conservatism <laughs> and I think it's a big part of the problem in the current um, epidemic and for those who don't know uh, uh, vitamin D was shown to extend lifespan in nematodes by the Lithgow lab at the Buck so there is a, a slight aging connection there as well. I'll share share um, uh, article as well. Um, maybe maybe you still hear, but if not, then definitely in the follow up. Um, okay, so let's see. There's so many different threads now. Um, I think one thing that we should be doing, which is what I think Joe mentioned and what uh, Aubrey had been kind of pointing to uh, in the email, uh, is talking about specific ways um, in which there's current opportunities either to submit uh, certain grants. Um, um, that, that could be based on this or different, different other ways in which um, we shouldn't miss the boat right now. Um, and so that would basically be like a kind of like an open sharing of just like, what have you realized and what kind of like research applications or grant applications have been going through, which haven't been going through. Um, I think uh, maybe we can schedule something like that um, for two weeks from now. I'm taking suggestions uh, for anything that you want to talk about. And uh, I will be updating the polls at the beginning of the Zoom with you guys' suggestions so we can see how many other people are interested in talking about this and think it's a good idea. Um, so please uh, um, keep them coming. For now, I would love to see you again uh, next uh, Friday at 11 a.m. And then we're going to have Gordon Loke and uh, Daniel Bocha, who's a Fawcett Fellow, and they're going to be discussing glycans, aging, and COVID-19. Um, I'm super excited for that. Uh, I would really, really love for all of you guys to share links to all of the things that you've referenced in uh, the email that was about today's event. Um, and I'm going to maybe start the thread, uh, and then we can discuss um, you know, what, what are specific um, potential follow-ups and do they uh, warrant a meeting? And uh, maybe it's a smaller meeting where only a part of the people join that are interested in, in discussing this further. Uh, but uh, I welcome all of you for now to share whatever, whatever we discussed in that, in that email. I'm also going to share uh, the video, which is now two hours long on the dot <laughs> in, uh, in that email. Um, and yeah, if you have any strong about published video, the Q&A part um, online, uh, then uh, please just drop me a note. I'm also going to tell uh, tell the tell the group again in the follow up email, so people can uh, video on that. Right? Uh, definitely, um, we want to aim for having a, tr a trustworthy container over publishing anything. Um, but maybe there is a lot of useful information out there as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we only went an hour over. What I'm going to do now <laughs> um, is I'm going to um, close out the main session, and instead of just closing out everything, I'm going to open up a, a, a one breakout room. I'm going to invite you all into it. And for those of you who'd like to stay on and discuss anything further, feel free to join there. Um, but I'm going to close uh, the, uh, the, main, the main salon out now. 
Uh, and yeah, please uh, let's con let, let's connect uh, in the email. And I hope to see you all next week. This was fantastic. I'm really, really, really happy by how many of you joined and by how informative and proactive the discussion was. Thank you so much. And uh, please help me make this useful to you. Bye, everyone. See you again next Friday.